in, uh, starting with just a couple of notes on the format of today's uh, presentation. Uh, so as you may have noticed from the poster, uh, we're going to be, um, we've organized today's presentation as a panel uh, where we're going to have uh, four mini presentations uh, from uh, different speakers across BSO teams uh, across the province. And um, before we get started, we really just want to acknowledge that um, everything that's being shared today is based on what has worked in other areas of the province. So certainly not every single idea and strategy is going to be applicable to every single long-term care home across Ontario, because we know that each home has their own uh, staffing, their own culture, as well as their own environmental design, of course, which, which, which significantly impacts the ability to trial uh, certain things, especially uh, during um, this, these, these pandemic times. So um, despite, um, oh, my apologies, uh, but so despite that, we're really hoping that each of you can walk away today with one or two ideas um, that, that you can try in your long-term care homes in your respective regions. So um, during the webinar, as we go through the four presentations, we invite everyone to make use of the Zoom chat pod. Uh, and in that chat pod, please feel free to put comments, questions, and share any of the ideas that, that are really resonating with you that you'd like to give a try. Uh, in your in your homes in your local region and um, of course following the four presentations today we hope that we've been able to reserve some time uh, to engage in some discussion uh, and following that just before concluding today we are going to have a couple of polls uh, so we invite you uh, to, uh, to stick around to the very end if you're able uh, and help uh, answer these polls so that we can guide future sessions as well all right, so as I mentioned, we're going to have four uh, sort of mini presentations as part of today's panel uh, from uh, four different regions, the Hamilton, Niagara, Haldeman, Brant region, the Northeast region, the North Simcoe, Muskoka region, as well as uh, over in the Southeast region. Uh, so I think that's enough from me. Let's dive right in and I'll turn things over to Catherine, Janet, Terry and Christy uh, from the h, &H region. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak today. It's a, it's an exciting opportunity for us to share um, all of our innovative practices during COVID at, in the H and H B Lynn. My name is Terry Glover. I'm the BSO strategic lead, and together with Christy McKibben, who is the uh, BSO coordinator, we run the strategic lead team. We have we have. We will be turning this over to the experts, Janet Plastow and Catherine Peaver, who will be um, doing their presentation on the innovative, wonderful things that that team did during COVID. So take it away, Janet. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> um, and thanks again for having us. Really um, glad to be here. I'm Janet Plastow. I am one of the uh, um, managers and educators for the BSO team and my cohort today is going to be Catherine Peaver who is one of our transitional leads I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of her experience. So a little bit about us we have a large land covers Hamilton, Niagara, Burlington, Haldeman and Brant and we cover 86 long-term care homes in that region. The next slide. Um, so we have about 70 staff in the field right now. We are down some staff if Matt leaves and pandemic crazies, but um, right now we've got about 70 uh, folks in the field. And of course, we are a consultative, non-pharmacological based service that helps um, with recommendations to assist long-term care homes in um, transitioning people into long-term care and while they're in long-term care uh, when they are having responsive behavior. So we assist those long-term care homes and coming up with recommendations and um, approaches that are going to work to mitigate some of those. Okay. Slide. Oh, we're frozen. Are we frozen? Hello. We Hello. can still hear you, Janet. Oh my gosh. Hello. Are you able to hear us, Janet? Hello. Am I back? 
we can hear you. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry guys. The slide didn't move forward and everybody was frozen. <laughs> really having some issues here. There we go, okay. So as a mobile team, our host employer is St. Joseph's Villa, long-term care in Dundas. Uh, when the BSO team started, we were a fully mobile team. So we were going to multiple homes, sometimes in one day. Um, as the team grew and as referrals continued to grow, we have transferred now into what we call a scheduled mobile team. So we do multiple homes. Our teams may have multiple homes, but they're now scheduled for certain days in those homes, allocated time according to how many referrals, et cetera, are happening in those homes. Um, uh, they get allotted more time if they, if they need it. Um, we have added also uh, mobile social workers and transitional leads to that service to service our LINs as well. Uh, but given our wide breadth, you can see that our referrals, um, the numbers continue to climb year after year. And we feel like we have an ability to have a really positive impact across, across practices and with 86 long-term care homes, which is a lot of homes to, to uh, have some impact on. And next slide. Sorry, I'm going to keep talking and assuming that you can hear me because I can't see the slides or what's happening there. So things were moving forward. Everything was going really, really well. And then, of course, it happened. COVID-19 hit. And on March 13th, 2020, we had to speak with our staff and our long term care homes um, to talk about the immediate changes that had to happen because of the pandemic. And so what that meant for us was we had to cement down into one home. We were no longer able to go from home to home. So not all of our homes uh, were getting services because we didn't have enough uh, staff to cover every single home in the Lynn. Um, so we, we took our, our busiest homes um, uh, and settled our staff in, and that included our mobile social workers and our transitional leads uh, that were cemented down into a home so that we could provide some coverage. Those announcements, of course, were met by all kinds of emotions from everybody involved, our homes and our staff, and left us constantly wondering, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to support those homes and how are we going to support our staff during the next several months? The next slide. Um, so the question that was asked right away from our BSO staff was, are we essential workers? And of course, our answer was a resounding yes, yes, yes. Um, it's really essential that we are in these homes and that we are more needed really than ever. Um, of course, things changed. What offer could we, uh, what kind of supports could we offer? Things had to change. So as homes were getting into all of these high um, stress times where they had to do swabbing, they had to do clinics, they had all of this. We appear to have lost Janet. Am I still on both. piece? Perhaps a poor connection. Can you hear me? Hello? Hi there, we can hear you. Hello? Can you hear me now? We can. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. It's very delayed. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> okay, so so many changes, added duties like screening tables and swab clinics. Um, our BSO, because we had so many roles, we have RPN, social service workers, PSWs, multiple, multiple roles. We were able to step in and um, go outside of our roles to help those homes out. So we were doing screening. We were helping if it was in our scope of practice, we were helping on the floors when they were short of staff, doing care, helping with um, uh, uh, mealtime preparations, et cetera, doing a lot of things that were kind of beyond our, our normal scope. Um, so we offered some of those supports, of course, to the homes that we were able to get into. And on the homes that we couldn't um, be a part of, we um, we offered them a lot of virtual support. So they were able to call in and myself and my co-educator were able to review files, talk about behaviors and assist them in any way that we could in a virtual way. And we also provided some of that information to our local 
psychogeriatric resource consultant so that they could add some added support to um, the homes that we weren't able to be in. Okay, uh, next slide. So just prior to the pandemic, we had also applied and become the first BSO team accepted into the RNAO best practice spotlight organization process. Um, and we were determined that we wanted to continue to build capacity and not lose some of our momentum that we had started in that program. Um, so we continued to work on that project, utilizing our, our steering committee, our RNAO coach and our staff with virtual groups. Um, and our first chosen best practice was person and family centered care. And we were pretty excited at the villa, we were asked to um, participate in a project with the villa. So the BSO and the admissions coordinators at the villa sat down and decided to look at how can we make transitions a little bit easier for people that are coming in during the pandemic. So we had a long period of time there where people were being dropped off at the door because families were not allowed to come into the home. Um, so we looked at things like setting up, um, we had a little bit of extra time because they had to get a swab before they were able to be admitted. So we set up television we families drop off um, room decor and their clothing. We got things labeled. We got their room set up properly before they arrived to the home. We set up um, uh, um, activity boxes in their room that were filled with things that were, um, you know, specialized to that person. So we looked at that individual and found out all kinds of information from their family in advance of them arriving and filled a box full of activities, et cetera, in the room so that they had access to that when they arrived. We set up virtual, or sorry, uh, weekly visits with the spiritual person in the home if that was appropriate. We set up ongoing rec staff visits as well. So we did a lot of prep work so that when that person transitioned in, uh, they arrived at least to a room that had some familiarity in it, some pictures hanging, some things that they were familiar with, and they had access to television, telephone, and all of those things. So that was kind of a really neat process. And we certainly shared that process across our Lynn with all of the homes um, that we have contact with so that that would open some discussions there about ideas around bringing folks in and transition for um, during the pandemic. And next slide. So each year we receive funding to provide education to all of our long-term care homes. And we were so excited last year, we were having tea the snow for a whole day. We had over 500 people registered, very exciting. And of course that got canceled in the spring. <laughs> we moved it to the fall. And of course it got canceled again in the fall. So um, that funding was still available and we didn't want it to go to waste. And we certainly didn't want the long-term care homes to go without that training. So we had to kind of reconvene. We have a uh, co-op team that sits together. It is representatives from other long-term care homes as well as the PRCs and ourselves. And we look about how we can spend these funds each year. What are the homes needing? And we decided that it was gonna have to be a virtual kind of thing this year. So we put together a, um, an education toolkit that went out to each long-term care home. Uh, they received cognitive, cognitive assessment tool workshops the 10th annual geriatric training program, five TIPA snow videos and gem cards, 10 seats for GPA online, and a couple of seats for pieces and also some mental health, mental health education that they would be able to access from their home and sign their folks up in the home so that they could carry on some of that education during the pandemic. Next slide. So as managers, we're no longer able to visit the staff in long-term care homes. We used to go out and do rounds and sit and look at files and talk to them about um, complex cases. And we, ain't, we weren't able to do that anymore. Um, we weren't able to have our in-house monthly meetings where staff came together and felt kind of connected. Those things were all on the back burner because of the pandemic. So in the beginning, we started having frequent telephone calls just with our staff to check in anxieties were very high. I'm sure you all kind of experienced some of that. And we were doing some parking lot visits, which were, of course, six feet apart, but at least seeing people face to face to kind of reduce some of that anxiety and make people feel as though they're um, being connected. Um, tried to remain positive um, and, and kind of relay some of those fears and what's happening and what's next and what's going on with their roles. There were a lot, a lot of questions around that. Um, so we wanted to find a way to reach out every day and thank them for all that they were doing beyond their normal role, make them feel connected and bring some positive light where it felt really dark at times. Next slide. 
Um, so this happened. Finding Light was created to share a positive message with our BSO staff team every morning. Jokes, well wishes, YouTube videos, positive messages were sent out daily to our staff to help them feel connected and start their day in a more positive light. Next slide. But after many weeks, we realized, okay, this isn't going to end quickly. The daily stuff is, we're running out of material. So we evolved from our daily emails and um, the weekly BSO Beacon was born. Uh, we wanted a way to continue to support our team and um, during the pandemic and provide them the information that would be really helpful. So we shared a lot of resources, self-care tips, tools to use with residents during COVID, health and safety information, stories that were shared from our staff, highlight some of the great things they were doing out there that were above and beyond to keep people motivated and inspired. All of those resources that were collected for the Beacon were also compiled in a resource list library and available to all of our staff. Um, and those resource listed were, lists were also shared with all of our long-term care homes as well. Next slide. So as time continued to move on and uh, weeks turned to months and our staff were feeling even more isolated from their teammates, we adopted Zoom and started having town hall meetings that allowed sharing of information and trying to help our teams feel more connected. And as we moved from uh, into the winter weather and stay at home orders, which prevented our parking lot visits, we adopted one to one virtual connections with our staff and are now setting up our smaller hub regional meetings again, virtually, which will start in March, in hopes that we can again start to help people feel a little more connected and hopefully moving back towards a little bit of more of a normal um, normal role. And next slide. So as our bubbles kept changing and the pandemic comes and goes in terms of outbreaks, um, we've continued to flex our needs to our homes. So in September, when the numbers were lower, things were going okay. Um, sorry. We, um, we moved back to our BSO tasks. So we moved back to doing some of our BSO work and away from some of the tasks that we were helping in the homes. Um, and that's been difficult for homes to get used to. They've gotten used to us kind of being able, a kind of a float in the building to fill in and do the work that needs to happen there, which was great. Uh, but as we know, resident behaviors did not cease to exist during the pandemic and we had to get back to our uh, BSO role to help them with those. So we focus on behaviors when the homes are not in outbreak and when they are in outbreak, if that happens, we go back to helping them uh, where they need help during that time. I'm going to pass this over now to Catherine. Hopefully she's still on there. She's just going to talk a little bit about her own um, experience as a TL during this time. Hi, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. I wasn't able to log online, so I'm doing this by telephone. Can everyone hear me? We can. You can hear me? Okay. So as a transitional lead, my role is to support clients that are living in the community that are exhibiting responsive behaviors, more specifically to support their transition into long-term care. So typically I would have a mix of clients living at their personal homes and clients living in a variety of long-term care homes within the Hamilton region. Since the onset of the pandemic, and I'm coming up to my one year anniversary here, I've been placed in one long-term care home and have been able to support the same type of clientele, but in a much quicker time frame and with less hands-on support from family members. It's really allowed me to gain a better understanding of how the different departments work together to best meet the needs of the residents within the home, which will be incredibly helpful when we go back to our new normal and we're back in different long-term care homes again. I've learned that less is often more. The strategies that I've trialed with the residents have been geared towards what is logistically possible given the different responsibilities of the resident's care team. Staff members are more likely to engage a resident in an activity when the materials are easily accessible and the setup time is quick. As Janet had mentioned previously, we continue to support transitions into long-term care. I've kind of become the middle person to ensure that as many of these bends are tied up as possible prior to the resident arriving by creating signage, learning about the routines from family members, and setting up their rooms with their personal belongings. One of my favorite things about the program was our ability to get together to discuss and brainstorm resident-focused strategies. Although we haven't been able to do this in person, we continue to collaborate using text, email, and Zoom. I'm going to pass this over to, I believe, Heather. So we just 
Yeah, just wanted to thank you again for the opportunity to share today. I'm sorry for all the bumps in our road over here. Not sure what's happening. It's not a full moon or anything, but we really look forward to hearing all the other presentations, finding continued inspiration about uh, you know, what other folks are doing during the pandemic. Perfect. Thank you so much to our Hamilton Niagara Haldeman Brandt team. Certainly a lot of ideas presented. And I think what really stands out to me is the, the flexibility. Uh, I think that might be a common thread in all the presentations today, as well as the focus on wellness. So thank you so much. Uh, so we are uh, next going uh, to move to the Northeast and I'll invite Heather to take the floor. Uh, and in the meantime, please feel free to use the chat pod uh, to put your comments, questions, uh, and, uh, and, and spotlight any of the ideas that really resonated with you from our h, &H team. Over to you, Heather. Hi everyone, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so I'm sharing on behalf of the Northeast uh, Behavior Support Team and particularly the Psychogeriatric Resource Consultants. And today I'll be spotlighting our Innovation Cafe. Um, so we get to share some ideas, some connections, and I'm able to share on behalf of the team how we've been able to continue and strengthen our connections because of COVID. So if you're not familiar with the Northeast, we cover quite a large area um, with a rather small team. Uh, so the Northeast is roughly the size of Germany. It's quite a large area. And here we measure things, um, we measure distance in terms of time. So from one edge of our catchment to the other, it's about seven hours north to south, it's about nine. And then we have some areas, of course, that we're only able to support um, in person when we take a, a plane or a train. Automobiles aren't particularly uh, accessible. So uh, we do that and, and I'm quite uh, proud to um, share that my team does uh, the members of the same team that I am on, pardon me, I do go up to uh, our northern coast. So I'm going to talk about our Innovation Cafe. So we started meeting uh, by Sublin regions and, and currently we have four Sublin regions um, back in March and April of 2020 on a bi-weekly basis via Zoom. And the whole purpose of this was to be able to share and discuss and highlight the emerging best practices coming forward at a provincial, national and international level um, with our teams. Uh, during these meetings, we would sort of spotlight um, a best practice. From there, we would, we actually very specifically talked about good news stories. So whether those be um, around uh, particular visits or innovations or just um, like Janet mentioned, some, some you know, lighthearted um, information to share with the team, still clinically relevant um, to be able to provide a sense of hope. And then from there, what we would look at is sharing any in-house, so any grassroots innovations that came forward. And we were very um, impressed by the level of creativity and thoughtfulness and compassion that was demonstrated by our BSO embedded long-term care resources. And so what we ended up doing was saying, you know, we can't let this good information go to waste and we wanna be able to share it uh, even more broadly with our uh, BSO community team since we do have that blended model. And, uh, with, of course, our provincial PCO, which is also co-located in the Northeast. So what you're seeing on our screen now is actually um, uh, um, an image of the tool. It is an interactive tool. I believe it's been uh, shared uh, at a few different venues. Um, and so what I'm going to point out is a few of the highlights from the tool. So yeah, next slide, Caitlin. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, and I'm going to pick the one up in the top um, right hand corner, you'll see a young man, this is from long term care home, and what they've done is they've purchased an OMI mobile interactive projector unit, and so they're able to uh, play games, a variety of different styles, and the only cleanup that's required is actually very um, <laughs> Sorry, it's saying move something away from the screen. Um, very uh, COVID friendly, very infection prevention and control friendly because it's a projector unit. All you need to do in terms of cleanup is to virox the table following the interaction. So 
uh, that was um, quite uh, helpful. Again, very COVID friendly engagement. Uh, you'll see below that, you'll see a beautiful group of uh, care providers in long term care setting. And what you'll notice is that, that their name tags are particularly large. And so with this team, yeah, this is our team over at Extended Care York. And what they've done is they took a story from the states that we had shared as part of our good news story, and they decided to run with it. And so in our tool, they write, seeing staff in masks and PPE can be very scary and intimidating for the residents. They don't know who we are and cannot recognize us. It's quite understandable that responsive behaviors increased in the context of care. Um, so what they noticed anecdotally was that if they quickly, you know, stepped back um, eight feet, removed their mask for a moment and said, hi, it's Heather or whoever it was, and then put on their mask, that level of recognition helped to decrease anxieties around who this person is and why they're providing care. So they implemented uh, name badges actually very quickly in about two weeks and they put uh, each staff member's picture on and not sort of a, a formal picture they put a picture of them smiling and like doing a happy face maybe thumbs up or waving that was quite large as well as a very clear indicator of the person's name and their role and not complicated roles it would simply say nursing or care support or meal support that sort of thing if we look at the image uh, next to that, so sort of middle um, bottom row, you'll see, and it's not particularly clear, but you'll see this is a very interesting um, anniversary celebration for this couple and what they've done with some um, public contacts and, and uh, agreement from the long-term care home was that for this family to visit, they did a window visit, but since she was located on the second floor, they in fact had a crane lift the husband up so that he could have a window visit on that second level of the home. So really, really creative. And the home was very flexible because it's not every day that you would say, yeah, you know, liability wise, let's go ahead and tote someone over the home to the inner courtyard, no less, so that they can have a window visit. But they agreed. Uh, it made the headlines here in Sudbury. And we have this wonderful image of them visiting. Uh, you'll see right next to that is a mobile tuck shop and we saw a lot of variations come forward from our teams including things like um, some really neat like ice cream truck designs coming out and hallway bingo and um, <laughs> hallway karaoke uh, uh, and happy hour and just really you know exciting um, innovative flexible solutions to maintain programming and social connections between the residents and between uh, volunteers and staff so that they could still feel like there was a bit of normalcy in their day-to-day -day lives. And then the last one you'll see up in the top corner, I just love, and this is from, oh, if you can go back, thanks. So this is a, an image from a Quemacong nursing home, and this is taken right off of their Facebook page. Uh, and they were one of the first long-term care homes to say, we're going to spotlight and connect with not just our family and friends on Facebook, we're going to connect with the world. And so what they've done is they, they post um, stories, they post, um, you know, different activities. I think the activity of them um, shooting a deer um, and a deer being one of their recreation team members with uh, Nerf guns um, also made the news. Uh, and so what they've done is they've tracked their connections and they highlight that back to the residents to say, you know, you matter, we care about you. And it turns out people around the world care about you as well. So they've tracked um, their likes and their comments and they see things from all over from Sweden, Greenland, um, Australia, Mexico, Canada, of course, and the US. So they're, they're tracking all their connections and they're bringing that back to um, the staff and to the people living at uh, the Wiki Nursing Home. So on the next page, we'll see uh, this beautiful image. And this is one of the elders who lives um, at the Wikwemekong Nursing Home. And we wanted to highlight this because it speaks to 
a few different areas of functioning. What she's doing when she uh, makes a cedar tea is uh, spiritual, it's healing, it is sensory care because you have this beautiful um, cedar fragrance that fills uh, the air in the home when she makes the cedar tea. She also um, builds social connection because they, they pour and they share it with um, the rest of the uh, residents, you know, if they like to partake. And it's really interesting because cedar has very high doses of vitamin C. And so vitamin C, you know, we know this helps with um, maintaining our immune system. It helps treat cold and fever. And so bringing this um, traditional health into the care home is welcomed, it's invited, and it's honored in that setting. So we want to be able to highlight that to you as well. And then the next thing that we've done, now this isn't COVID specific, but we've been working on it over time and found that it has been very helpful in the context of COVID. And this is the knowledge to practice consultation. And what this consultation is, is it's based on a, on, um, a blending of the pieces um, framework and our knowledge to practice model that's been adopted by BSO and the RGPs. And so what we're able to do is have a very fulsome review process of, um, let's say, uh, with our, our uh, integrated response teams and community or with our BSO embedded resources in long term care, we're able to review any um, clinical um, discussions, any clinical scenarios, provide written feedback based on the team discussion. And usually our outcomes are focused on either um, screening, capacity building, um, additional non pharmacological um, strategies to try potentially flagging need for a specialty consultation or additional communication strategies within the team. So as we go through this pieces process, we're also implementing the knowledge to practice framework. And what's wonderful is that because it's a record of conversation, we can also complete these not just in person, but over OTN, of course, for privacy or uh, for telephone. And again, we produce that um, record of, of clinical discussion. So we found that to be very helpful, especially in the context of COVID since, um, you know, we do have these orders from um, Minister Ford to ensure that uh, we do sort of wrap this uh, hedge of protection as he tends to say around long-term care. Next. The other thing that we've been doing is we've been actually very consistent in maintaining our processes. So many of our processes, because we are the size of Germany, uh, many of our processes were already virtual. And so we've been able to maintain those. And I think by providing a sense of consistency and accountability to our teams, they've come to see our, our BSO PRCs, our uh, provincial coordinating office and our central intake system as being extremely supportive and helpful in maintaining um, you know, clinical process, clinical structure, and again, just a bit of sense of normalcy in day-to-day -day life. Yeah. So thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm very privileged to be co-located with the Northeast BSO team. And uh, it's so exciting to be able to celebrate all of these creative innovations, uh, cranes and no cranes. Um, so I'm getting some questions being sent directly uh, in the chat pod for our discussion. So uh, definitely want to reserve some time for discussion today. So that being said, I will turn things over to Nancy uh, to share with us some of the innovation happening in North Simcoe, Muskoka. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, so, I mean, I'll just kind of give you a bit of an overview of what our our, uh, our Lynn has with respect to services and such. Uh, we service 26 long-term care homes across our region. Our region is rather broad and we have, you know, a team comprised of RNs, RPNs, uh, community support workers, behavioral specialists, and PRCs that are support us with our regional education. Um, our model is kind of a hybrid model in the sense that we have staff aligned with homes. However, they are not employees of that home. We are very fortunate to have a, a wonderful partner for our uh, BSO team um, with the County of Simcoe as the employer for all of our long-term care team members. Um, also within our uh, structure, we have our RN team leads. Uh, they provide our actual education and capacity building in long-term care. And historically that was done through our PRCs. However, that shifted a couple of years ago. And so they're actually able to 
to kind of wear dual hats. They both do kind of that direct clinical care, but also that education capacity. If you could advance, please. So as everybody encountered in March, we had to make some changes to our uh, alignment of how we delivered our service. So we ended up switching to obviously one staff per long-term care home. Historically, they had been uh, aligned according to numbers of beds per home. So often they were supporting in multiple homes. Um, and as a result of that change, now they were supporting in one. As well, we were limited in being able to support all 26 homes for a variety of reasons, one being specifically staff resources, but also outbreaks, as well as, you know, not, um, not being able to provide support just because of the, the limitations that the home themselves had imposed around, you know, limiting folks entering into the facility. So we did, uh, we historically had always provided kind of a weekly schedule, but we had to adjust that in order to be a bit more specific around um, when they could expect the staff in the home because of the, the conditions with COVID and swabbing and all of that stuff. So um, those changes were made. Uh, if you could advance, please. We are actually very fortunate in our Lynn to have everybody equipped with a laptop and a phone, as well as um, access to uh, uh, Ontario Telemedicine Network uh, account, as well as connecting Ontario for our registered staff. So that was kind of a big um, advantage for us as we had to adapt and adjust to these changes and implementing kind of virtual care. Um, and as a result, we were able to kind of pretty well, for the most part, kind of keep our, our system moving consistently, as mentioned with Heather, that consistency was a strength for us because we were able to align staff, but also have the ability to adopt that virtual uh, a care right away. So we were able to facilitate those assessments, um, utilizing that equipment, and that helped to kind of, you know, uh, avoid any delays and in, in support and that kind of thing, as well as it actually provided us with some efficiencies. I had staff reporting back to me at different times, you know, I was able to do these three, three different activities, uh, you know, a, a visit, an assessment, and um, meeting with a physician in the hour and a half where normally I would never have been able to do that. So that was great that they were able to be that much more responsive to the system and to the needs of those residents. Um, we also uh, managed to secure temporary access with some of our homes around accessing the remote PCC software so that the team was able to provide those assessments and um, respond to those requests without having to further burden the team in the long-term care home, which, I mean, I, I think we all recognize everybody's very, very busy and trying to respond and, and needs are increased. So that was a, a great strength for many of our homes that we were able to access that um, as a temporary measure. As well, we spend a lot of time um, training our staff on how to, you know, do those virtual assessments, recognizing that more often than not, a lot of the homes were aligned with an unregulated staff. So our, our registered staff weren't necessarily there in order to do some of that um, assessment. So they were able to adopt those virtual assessments in order to support that. If you could advance as well. Um, sorry, just before that, we were also fortunate enough um, to be able to support beyond kind of our scope, but still within our scope. Um, and in particular, we actually had a very significant outbreak in our region. And as a result, we were able to embed a staff from our team, a senior experienced staff for a period of time in order to really lead that behavioral response in that home during that significant outbreak. Um, and it, it, I think all would agree that amongst all of those partners that made a big difference in that home. So we were very fortunate for that. Um, with respect to education, we um, are, again, leaning on that technology, we have the ability to do more of that in the moment education. We're trying to, you know, schedule education uh, on a routine basis. We've always been able to do that, but now with COVID and those changes and the demands on staff, it was harder and harder for us to be able to kind of have those education sessions happen because staff weren't available, that kind of thing. So as a result of that technology, we're able to lean on having those repositories of standardized materials and we could provide that in the moment education, sometimes with a laptop at a nursing station with the team and we just pull people in and said, here we go, let's talk about this and we were able to provide that education. From our own team perspective, um, not being able to be together and have that same collaborative, cohesive um, practice together we adopted the coffee breaks early on because we were recognizing that the team was feeling a bit disconnected. It provided an opportunity for folks to, you know, talk about ideas, share what they're doing in that particular home they're supporting. 
um, get some ideas around interventions, they were also able to meet with their manager um, for that dedicated time where, you know, typically in this time we weren't able to necessarily connect as often. So knowing that they had that dedicated time available helped to kind of support them with that work in order to continue. As well, our RN um, team leads were able to adjust their education format and try to to meet the needs of the homes and saying that we had kind of dedicated, structured, scheduled education. And we typically they would do it kind of one on one with their actual homes that they were aligned with. We opened it up to broader um, regions and, and incorporating multiple homes. So that way you could get more more support um, through one event versus trying to utilize uh, single events. Um, what else can I say? If you could move ahead for me, thanks. Um, so as a result too, we, um, as part of our SGS overall planning and approach to COVID, we had developed a multidimensional strategy. And so some of those things that came out of that in response were early on in COVID, we had um, hired or brought on a recreational therapist who was able to um, participate in some huddles with the long-term care enrichment teams in order to support kind of communication and idea sharing at that point. We also, in partnership with OSMH or Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital here, were able to develop an orientation checklist, recognizing that staff were going to be moving about um, and some that were not going to be familiar with long-term care were going to be supporting in long-term care. So we provided that checklist. We were able to develop that in partnership in order to kind of help prepare those staff for when they would be supporting, you know, looking at things around even the legislation, just understanding all those aspects. So that was very helpful. As well, in the fall, um, confinement syndrome, we did a lot of uh, promotion around that. We had a whole week long series whereby recognizing the impact of COVID-19 and isolation and um, the, the effects of that on our seniors, our residents in long-term care. And so we did a very targeted education uh, series over a week, which included um, bringing that information to our long-term care teams as well. We had regional education uh, sessions through Zoom and our virtual platforms, but also at the, at the home side, we were able to do that through our, our staff as well. And then of course, we have our social media. Um, more recently, we just did a big campaign on show the love. I don't know if you saw that hashtag show the love for our long-term care and retirement homes, whereby we had representation across all of our region, um, uh, political members, families, different folks all posting um, pictures and messages and things like that. We had uh, one organization write a song and it was just targeted around kind of showing our uh, residents and uh, staff in long-term care, you know, that we really appreciate everything they've done and just wanting to really try and support them and build them up during this time. Cause you know, it's been very hard for everyone, um, but certainly that, that group of folks has really taken a lot of the, uh, a lot of the burden more recently so um, as well with respect to education kind of from a regional perspective not wanting to lose focus we typically would have a lot of education happening and then because of COVID we can't actually get together in rooms uh, so trying to figure out how do we adopt and change and get ourselves uh, in a virtual uh, platform in order to deliver this standardized education and we were able to do that so we have our GPA going uh, virtually. We have our seniors mental health program as well as pieces. It's just recently piloting that. So we're, we're, we've are we're been able to adopt and adjust and, and change in order to respond to that need. And um, one other thing we were able to fortunately do for our, our uh, long-term care staff in this region. And again, it's, it's really about, we were just trying to show that love. We were able to partner with Wella Canada and able to get uh, over $250,000 worth of product, approximately of hair care products to donate to all of our long-term care staff, just to say thanks. And so there's, uh, I think, a, hopefully a lot of recognition that they felt as a result of that, that, that gift that we were able to secure. So um, I don't know if I have anything else there. I believe that was your last slide. That was it? Okay. So, yeah. So thank you so much for that. Um, I hope that uh, that was helpful for you guys, or at least hearing what we've been able to do was, you know, exciting. I think it's been a hard year for everybody. So just being able to just recognize the hard work that everybody's done. So thank you. Absolutely. And loving all the creative strategies with the, the products as well as the, the Show the Love campaign. We did see that on Twitter um, and all those videos and all those photos were so creative and very cool to see. Thank you so much. 
All right, so I will turn the floor over to uh, our last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, region uh, represented uh, today, and that's over in the southeast. So I will turn things over to Kim and Kathy. Great, thank you, um, and and welcome everyone, and and so excited to uh, participate in in the meeting today, and and hear from from our partners across the province. So just to give you a bit of background, Province Care was identified as the BSO lead in the Southeast um, because we already had the Seniors Mental Health Outreach Team uh, program as well as the Psychogeriatric Resource Consultant uh, program. So we have four outreach teams across the Southeast. We have, uh, we cover the counties of Hastings, Prince Edward, Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington and Lanark, Leeds and Grenville. We have uh, three PRCs, so one in each of the three corridors, and we have um, developed three mobile response teams with the initial BSO funding, and then we've been able to uh, embed funds in 17 out of the 36 long-term care homes we support. And uh, so we call our BSO uh, program a blended model of behavioral support. And our outreach PRCs and mobile response teams work as an integrated team and we work integrated as well with our embedded resources. So Kim and I are going to uh, go back and forth slide to slide and I'll hand it over to Kim now. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. So I'll start off with some of our uh, capacity enhancement uh, activities. The Southeast Care Network, um, you'll find that we love acronyms. So that was the coordinated access to resources electronically. It was very similar to um, what Heather spoke about in the Innovation Cafe. So bringing the long-term care homes together um, to share resources, share things that they had come up with. Um, and, and I kind of laugh because I was reflecting, we started on WebEx, moved to Teams and have landed on Zoom. So not only have we needed to adapt, our long-term care home partners have also needed to adapt and, and everyone's done that so graciously. Um, so some of the topics, uh, I can remember a very lively discussion sharing um, scheduling platforms for scheduling virtual visits and you know the homes um, sharing some of the ideas with, with some of the technology Technologies that they, they had been using because that task was, was very overwhelming at the beginning. So um, it went from that all the way to um, specific education on caring for residents, younger residents with uh, stroke or brain injury. So we've really covered the gamut um, in terms of the Southeast Care Network. And then the Choose Your Own, um, Choose Your Own Adventure Capacity Enhancement Plan. Oh, uh, Caitlin, I'll just ask you to go back. Perfect. Um, so as others have said, you know, we really needed to to pivot and offer things virtually. Um, so what, what we did was we um, literally offered a menu of capacity enhancement, um, told the long-term care homes what their budget was, what each course cost, um, and let them pick what was what they needed to do. Um, it's been tremendously successful. We've gotten wonderful feedback on it um, and, and really allows the homes to target their own needs rather than us trying to pick what's what's most needed in the region on any sort of uh, given year. So that's been, a, that, that's been a really successful strategy for us. And pass it back over to Kathy for the next slide. Great, so I'll just speak to our alternate service delivery through COVID with our BSO uh, mobile response team. And our, our function really with our mobile response team is to provide urgent, semi-urgent behavioral support, to provide some assist and model care strategies as well as transition support. So with COVID, of course, everything changed. And as, as previous presenters have said, we've had to pivot quickly. And so with Directive 5 and the one long-term care home employer only, of course, wasn't really written for a mobile response team. So we did have one employer, although they visited multiple long-term care homes. So um, with, with COVID, actually, um, what we did was we then assigned um, each PSW to a long-term care home who was in need of behavioral support at that time. And then our, our registered staff actually worked virtually with remote access to the electronic client records, and they were able to support the long-term care homes when there were behavioral needs as well. So, um, and, and we had uh, referrals from long-term, and, and the referrals went down, uh, but then they started coming back up uh, quite quickly. So the long-term care homes with BSO embedded resources, as well as the long-term care homes without the BSO embedded resources were referring. 
what we did actually um, see was benefit for that longer period of time that we were partnering with a long-term care home because our before we would see multiple long-term care homes in a week or even in, in a day, I think as, as HH and, and B had um, said. Um, but when we had when we had BSO resources embedded for a longer period of time, we saw um, the sustainability of strategies. Uh, as well as long-term care uh, team members seeing the benefit of the mobile response team interventions rather than being there maybe for three days and then popping back out and checking back in in a week. And then we also saw um, greater benefit with the mobile response team and long-term care working more as an integrated uh, team. And then, uh, so, so we had uh, team members spending like um, at least one month in a long-term care home and then we get another referral. So then we had to um, develop a strategy and a checklist actually to um, move one, long, one, uh, one MRT team member to another long-term care home. And so we had to um, ensure that we were following best practices in terms of IPAC. Um, they've had multiple um, COVID tests, our, our uh, mobile response team PSWs. They had to make sure that they weren't in a home that had an outbreak, et cetera. So that's um, really uh, what we did uh, with that change in long-term care homes when the referrals came in. And then every long-term care home has a behavior support liaison identified whether they have funding or not. And each long-term care home in partnership with our, outreach, with our integrated team of outreach PRC and mobile response team have monthly behavioral support collaborative meetings. And so those meetings have, have gone virtual to limit the number of people in, in long-term care. So I'll hand it over now to Kim. So as others have mentioned, it became very apparent to us early on that um, the activities available to residents mm. during COVID were going to be severely limited. And we had some very significant concerns um, about the increased use of physical and chemical restraints um, to try and um, manage residents with with responsive behaviors, for lack of a better word. Um, so, so we came up with two quality improvements projects. Um, the first one was our SAFE project, the acronyms for Stimulating, Accessible, Fun, and Engaging. And that's the, the descriptors that we were using to, um, to describe the activities and the activity kits that we were putting together. Um, they were targeted at specific residents who we knew would be at risk of responsive behaviors because of the COVID-related restrictions. So it was a very interesting collaboration between our PRC, um, our occupational therapist, and the uh, mobile response team, so our BSO mobile teams. Uh, and they, they came up with some fabulous, fabulous ideas, all resident-centered. Um, and quick, quick note on the data, there were um, seven residents that participated, six of them had improved, and the measures we had were decreased PRN medication use, decreased falls, uh, decreased reliance on staff for ADL support, and one particular resident had decreased medication use uh, for anxiety. So really overall successful project and looking for ways that we can, uh, we can expand on that in the future because it's certainly going to remain an issue. The second uh, QI project we had was the iPad pilot. So we had three iPads and deployed them to three of our PSWs. And they were tremendously creative in how they use these iPads, uh, working again specifically with residents who had been referred to our mobile team uh, for responsive behaviors. And, and again, we had 17 instances of iPad use. They averaged about 20 minutes each, which is actually slightly higher than the than and the uh, research suggests, and all but one uh, were redirected from passive or no activity. And in fact, some people were actually um, directed away from a responsive behavior. Mm -hmm. So pacing physically responsive behaviors with the iPad. So Kathy has fortunately found the money and ordered more. Uh, so we're looking to expand that, uh, the, the availability of those iPads to more of our staff. Kathy, the next few are yours. Yeah, and, and this is our, our last uh, um, slide. Uh, I, mean, I think we have about four slides, but it's all about transitions. And um, the single, so we, we really wanted to focus on transitions um, to support clients be, being in the right level of care and to support that system flow. 
And um, we actually uh, really uh, supported the single transitions and, and much like our, our previous presenter said was really to um, support when the family couldn't be there. So we had um, one person actually, we had a, took an opportunity to help transition one person from hospital to long-term care. And we had our registered staff from the mobile response team meet the person at the hospital to develop that transition plan and then met them at the long-term care and supported them for two weeks for that seamless transition. And really um, what we saw was the benefit of, of continuity across the system with MRT supporting that transition. What we had done in the past was our transition support actually just met the person at the long-term care home. So we just backed this up in, uh, um, in the transition from a hospital. So the next one, um, if you go on to the next slide, Caitlin, that's great. We actually looked at a transition isolation project and really it was to um, our, our Southeast Lynn uh, partners um, spoke to us and they actually thought, well, if we give you money, we could um, do transition and you could support 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the 14 day isolation. And I went, oh my goodness, we won't be able to find the staff to do that. And, and if we did, we would actually be pulling from an already burdened system of care of long-term care. So what we decided to do is we partnered with one long-term care home and it happens to be the long-term care home with Providence Care, uh, Providence Manor. And we, co and we transitioned a cohort of five residents into an isolation unit where the 14 day quarantine could take place. And that was to mitigate the risk of transmission. Well, at the same time, bringing uh, people in at the same, uh, you know, at the same uh, time frame. And we really wanted to support that seamless transition for residents who are living with progressive uh, dementia. We also wanted to mitigate the risk uh, for people living at home and they were at risk of, of wandering and responsive behaviors and or caregiver burden. So we actually did a pull strategy, bringing people um, from hospital and community. And we really wanted to help with system flow by transitioning a cohort of people. Otherwise, um, it was just one person here and there. In, uh, in the Southeast, we were down 300, 340 beds, I believe, because of, of uh, COVID and the four bed uh, ward rooms. Okay, so that was our project. And if you go to the next slide, this was a collaboration. Our partnership was with, the lo with this long-term care home, our mobile response team and the Southeast Lynn Home and Community Care. So we developed this unit on a secure unit um, for five new residents. The long-term care home was supported actually with funding from the Southeast Lynn um, so that we had 24 hour uh, RPN and PSW plus one full-time recreation therapist. And the mobile response team support it with one FTE of an RPN and an FTE of PSW. And it was a shared care model. Um, and we were able to develop the behavioral support care plans to transition then these five people back to their, into their home unit within this same long-term care home. So we actually then provided transition support, our mobile response team to their, their new unit. Okay, next slide. And um, so when we think about the possibilities, um, we're, we think about the replication of this process across other regions. We've actually had um, within the Southeast, we've had um, requests for um, another long-term care home to do a similar project with them. And it really fostered that shared care model and best practice approach to transition and behavioral care planning. Um, everybody wanted it to succeed. And then we also saw, you know, we're, we're thinking we're going to see an increase in acceptance rate for people who have or are at risk of wandering or responsive behaviors in COVID-19. What we saw were a lot of the long-term care homes were saying we can't do that because we can't manage that 14-day um, isolation. And then also, of course, the, the uh, added bonus of the strength, strength and partnerships between long-term care, our BSO mobile response team, our uh, Southeast Lynn Home and Community Care partners, um, as well as uh, our hospitals. And I think that's it, Caitlin. I'm sorry we went a few minutes over. 
Not a problem, Kathy. There was so much to share, I think, from all of the regions that, that presented today. And uh, we're just so thankful that each of you were able to take the opportunity uh, to present. Um, and I have noted down, so there were uh, some individuals who sent along uh, some questions uh, just through private message. Um, I'm very mindful that we are already over time. So I think if it's okay with everyone, we'll continue to collect these questions um, and follow up uh, with uh, an email, um, but we have uh, at this point launched a poll uh, whereby we're just looking for some insight from those of you who were able to attend today um, about what time of day uh, would be best uh, to host future webinars, uh, as well as if there's a preferred day of the week, please let us know. Um, and then we're also looking for suggestions for future lunch and learn sessions. Uh, if you have any, I see uh, um, a yes so far. Uh, if you're able uh, to throw those in the chat pod, uh, we would love your recommendations for future topics uh, for future sessions. And I'm just seeing a message here that it's saying that it won't let anyone put suggestions in. Um, so if you'd like to, I'm not sure if there's a setting that you can change for the chat pod, Ruth, but if not, please feel free to private message them and we'll make sure that uh, those are added to the list. Or they can, Caitlin, they can also um, directly just send the, the suggestions to me at rwelford at lakehidu.ca. I think everybody's got my email address, so. Perfect. So prior to closing, um, I'm not sure, Ruth, if I should turn it over to you for final words. That would be, well, that would be wonderful. I just don't know what to say because I just am so, um, it's just so it's such an impressive um, amount of work that everybody's put together in in responding to COVID-19 and pandemic. I think um, we are all going to walk away from this looking at the different strategies and the different ways that you have all adapted. And, and I think the thing that I like the most is just your flexibility and the importance of supporting your team and ultimately providing better care for for, for the residents or the, the individuals in the community. It, it's truly remarkable, I feel, and, and I thank you all. I know you're busy people, so it was really nice that you were even able to take this time to share with us um, at the center. So we thank you very much. And um, as Caitlin has mentioned, we are um, recording this and Caitlin and I will take the, the, the uh, questions and compile them and, and respond accordingly. I'm sure everybody's gonna get lots of inquiries individually too, because it's just been awesome work. So I say um, in closing, take care everyone, keep well and um, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks so much, bye-bye.